Good evening, everyone. I'm Lucy Gray, and I'm the co-chair of the Global Education Conference. We're really thrilled to have you with us tonight as we, well, tonight where I am, um, as we bring to you um, a global educator from the state of Maine. And I'd like to introduce Erin Towns to you. I met Erin two summers ago, I believe, at a conference that I was invited to speak at in Maine. And she has been doing amazing work with GIS and, and traveling the world and doing all sorts of things. So I thought that I would invite her um, to speak with us tonight because I think it's always important, as I said in the chat here, uh, to hear real stories from real teachers doing real things. And um, if you have any questions or anything like that as we continue tonight, please make sure that you put them in the chat. And Erin, I, I will moderate that for you if you need it. And um, I hope that we all can make some great connections via this session and get some, um, and learn about some great resources and that sort of thing. Um, what else can I tell you about Erin? Anyway, I'm going to let her tell you a little bit more about herself, and I'm going to take us through the beginning um, drill here, and then I'll turn it over to you, Erin, in a second. Um, we want to thank our sponsors so much for making this possible. Um, please uh, patronize these organizations. Take a look at their websites, their resources. Uh, they have amazing programs for people, for global educators. Um, Participate in particular is hosting a competition this week with uh, creating collections of global resources on their website. So make sure to follow them on Twitter. We also have it part of our, our professional development game that's part of the conference. Um, and that game is brought to us by Ludo Learning. And if you would like a participant certificate, you can play that game. Um, the link is on the front page of our website and earn a certificate for doing all sorts of cool activities. Um, so without further ado, thank you to our sponsors. Now I'm going to enable the whiteboard privileges. And to the left of the map, you'll see a set of tools. If you click on the star, you can tell us, you can double click on that and then click on your location in the map and tell us where you are in the world in the chat. I am in Northbrook, Illinois, which is just outside Chicago. And it's 6 o'clock at night uh, for me here. And it is pretty cold for this time of year for us, but it's getting a little warmer. And um, we've got Tennessee representing and Nepal. And I know we have Guam here. I see Thomas in here. In Connecticut, in Indiana, in New Zealand. Anybody else from someplace? Evanston. All right, Evanston. Yay. I'm very close to you, Tracy. North Carolina, Washington, D.C. Your sound's not working. OK, if your sound's not working, um, the whiteboard is enabled. Let me double check and make sure it is. Um, does it work now? I think I gave you the screen sharing privileges and not the whiteboard. Sorry, guys. And um, if your sound is not working, my tip for you is to go to the tools menu at the very top of your window and select audio and then audio setup wizard. That's where you would control that. So that would be helpful. If you, um, if you have difficulty still, I would leave and come back and see if that works out. All right, so we have Dallas. We also have New York, St. Paul, Minnesota. A lot of U.S. people right now. And I see New Zealand way down the corner there. That's great. All right, um, so I'm going to leave that up for a second if you want to take a minute. I think we've got just about everybody represented on the map. And I'm going to turn this over to Erin. So welcome, Erin. We're so glad to have you here. All right. Can people hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. You sound great. All right. Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, good evening and happy International Education Week uh, to all of you. I am really, really excited uh, to be able to spend some time with you tonight talking about global professional development for teachers. 
What I'm going to be doing uh, throughout the presentation is putting some links in the chat box. So if you want to follow along or look into a program that I am talking about, uh, you can feel free to do so uh, while I discuss it. So uh, welcome to everybody from uh, all over the world. Uh, I am really, really, really excited to see you here today. Uh, as Lucy told you, I am an educator uh, at Edward Little High School in Auburn, Maine. Uh, for those of you that do not know where Auburn, Maine is, uh, the state of Maine is in the northeast section of uh, the United States. Our community is home to about 23,000 people. Uh, historically, uh, the populations uh, reflect Native American uh, backgrounds, Irish, uh, mainly Western European. Uh, and our traditional economies include things like fishing and mill work. Uh, in early, well, the late 1990s and early 2000s, the demographics of our area of the United States changed drastically. Uh, and we had the entrance of thousands of uh, Somali refugees that came uh, into our community. Uh, at the time, you know, the meeting of two cultures in the state of Maine uh, did not prove to be uh, an easy transition. Uh, at first, uh, there were two different types of religions, uh, mainly uh, Roman Catholic and uh, Islam were meeting uh, each other for the first time. Um, and a backlash started to slowly uh, really, really envelop the community. Uh, we had problems with white supremacist groups, um, you know, coming to the state of Maine, having a number of different rallies. Uh, we had problems with somebody that made the unfortunate decision to roll a pig's head through the new mosque uh, in town. And uh, we had fights in our hallways at school because our hallways at school really, really, really are sort of a micro world of what's going on outside. So needless to say, uh, as a public school educator, I was horrified by what I was seeing. I was mortified. Um, and my want of seeking out more knowledge about the world and the ability to bring the world into my classroom and teach my students about diversity really was born in those years. Um, essentially, my community was in a lot of trouble, and so that was the problem that I identified in my community and really, really catapulted me into an entirely new professional and personal world of global travel. Um, also, at any time, I, I'm going to go through this presentation. If you have any questions, uh, please just feel free to type them into the chat box, and I will definitely uh, get to those questions. I, I will leave a little bit of time at the end, and anything that you want to ask, please, please feel free uh, to do so. So um, today, this, this is what our school community uh, looks like, much, much more diverse. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, from early 2000, uh, our diversity uh, has changed significantly in the area where I teach. Uh, we have 30 plus cultures reflected in our school population, and they are um, and and the diversity has come a really really long way. And it's thanks to a handful of educators in our area that were dedicated to global education and an administration that was willing uh, to do a lot of things to promote diversity within our schools. Currently today our largest populations of students are uh, refugee students, that is, are coming uh, from uh, places like the Democratic Republic of Congo. And then, of course, we have an entire Iraqi population that has made its way uh, to making Maine their new home. So I guess uh, when Lucy asked me to speak, uh, one of the things that I like to talk a lot about and that uh, I present uh, in a lot of places, aside from being a classroom teacher. I've been teaching for about 16 years. This is my 17th year, actually, teaching. Um, is this push that I want to see in a change in regards to relevant professional development. Um, we had a teacher leader 
group that met in the state of Maine and were asked what their largest problems were as classroom educators and professional development uh, was top of the list. Uh, they reported things like a lack of practical application strategies being offered by our professional development opportunities, um, too much emphasis on only standards and proficiency-based education, uh, which is incredibly important, but it was sucking all of the time uh, that they had. And as such, it was leaving a little time, you know, for things like technology development. Um, my school is blessed to have uh, technology in our classrooms, uh, but even so, even for schools that did not have um, that opportunity, it, their students were still using technology at, in their homes and outside, and very little uh, development was being done with students in the classroom. Aside from that, the ability to network and actually work with colleagues uh, was cited as being a really, really uh, big problem. So um, what I have found in participating in global professional development programs has been um, a, a sense of relevancy, you know, uh, a sense of, you know, being able to answer really tough questions that come up in class, things that I couldn't answer uh, prior to uh, my travels. Uh, questions like, why do we have to know this? What is so important about this? And I could give standard answers to all of those questions, but nothing that really I felt satisfied uh, my students' questions. Um, I have found that global professional development has assisted me with combating uh, apathy in the classroom and uh, helping me to encourage respectful communication, informed uh, discourse and dialogue uh, among my students. So those are some of the benefits to that. So Global PD, what does it look like? I am going to tonight take you through, um, let's see, I'll introduce you to four uh, different programs that I participated in uh, in the past, uh, since 2008. Uh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about each one. I won't go into uh, tremendous detail. Um, I'm going to also share examples of final follow-on projects that are expected when you do uh, participate in these programs. And uh, I will tell you a little bit about tips and give you some considerations of things that you might want to think about before you seek out professional development. And I'm going to give you resources that you can research on your own to find a program that will suit your lifestyle uh, and suit your, um, how comfortable you are with traveling. And those resources will be not only for U.S. teachers, but I will also provide resources for teachers outside of the United States who are interested in uh, also um, traveling the world. Oh, I see Somali immigrant refugees. There has been the same friction. Minnesota, yes. We don't know how immigrants are placed in the United States. Uh, immigrants in the state of Maine are actually, there are a number of resettlement agencies that are used. I believe that there are about seven of them across the United States. The agency that helps resettle immigrants in the state of Maine is Catholic Charities. Um, I don't have the names of the other agencies off the top of my head. Uh, if any of you know what those are, please feel free to include them in the chat box. Um, to answer that question. Let's see. Uh, and are they directed to certain cities? Yes. The um, original resettlement cities in the United States uh, are referred to as primary resettlement cities, and it included places like Atlanta, Georgia, Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, tended to be the larger of, of the resettlement um, cities. The students that ended up in Maine and the population and the thousands of individuals that came to Maine, um, that was actually started by a handful of Somali families who got to Atlanta, Georgia, and decided that they wanted to raise their children in a smaller town atmosphere. Um, they were placed in low-income housing. Uh, they were fighting with things like high crime rates 
you know, and were concerned and, and really wanted to find another place. Uh, I was told by one of the initial individuals that came, um, you know, from Somalia into the state of Maine that they chose that because they were looking for cities that had a lot of affordable housing and great, you know, school systems. And uh, Maine was formerly uh, a mill area, and when the mills closed, we had a lot of available affordable housing uh, for refugees that was um, really, really, uh, you know, uh, sort of a selling point for them. Uh, and so that is how uh, refugees and immigrants uh, from Somalia found their way to Maine initially. All right. So, yeah, let's see. Okay. So, uh, the Japan Fulbright Fund, uh, excuse me, the Japan Fulbright Memorial Fund teacher program was my very, very, very first um, global professional development opportunity. I remember I was sitting at school one day, and across my, we have system-wide email, and there was an email from, apparently, a grant writing office that was part of our school system. Up until that moment, I was not aware that we had a grant writing office that would help teachers acquire grants, you know, for uh, professional travel. And uh, so I decided to go down and introduce myself to the grant writer, and she and I struck up a friendship uh, that has been very strong. Uh, she is definitely a huge reason why um, I was able to get some of the early uh, global professional development opportunities. Um, but even if you don't have a grant writing office, and even if you don't, you know, like have um, access to uh, professional help on that, um, you certainly can track down a large network, even right here at the Global Education Conference, of many teachers who have traveled who would be willing to work with you, to read essays, and give you constructive feedback. And I think that that's the beautiful thing about something like the Global Education Conference is that it gives you friends, you know, and we all have the same aims. Uh, and we want to see each other and all of our students succeed in a better world. Uh, and so um, feel free to reach out and use those resources that you have here. So um, this was my introduction to global travel, and it was quite something. Um, one consideration that you want to have before you travel is how long of a program do you want to participate in? I have seen programs that are as short as four days, and I have uh, participated mainly myself in programs that are about a month long, anywhere from four to six weeks. Some global professional development opportunities can last as long as six months. Uh, depending on uh, what you're going for. So I will introduce, you know, a little bit uh, of all of it uh, tonight for you. So uh, this was a 30-day trip uh, to Japan. Uh, it included, before we left, um, mandatory readings, pre-departure orientations. Our pre-departure orientation flew all of the teachers that were accepted that year uh, to uh, San Francisco. And we had lectures on things like protocol. Um, some basic language courses, uh, a lot about history and government and the structure of society. Um, and, you know, it always, always includes sort of a welcome event that allows you to get to know other educators. And the beautiful thing is, is that once you meet them and once you travel with them, you're friends for life. Uh, and I have certainly found that. The Japan Fulbright Memorial Fund Teacher Program ended in 2008. However, uh, the program has now, you know, you can still have the opportunity uh, for a fully funded program. It's a short study tour. I think it's about 10 days to 14 days um, through the Japan-U.S. Teacher Exchange Program for Education for Sustainable Development. So uh, it's the same type of thing. And let me tell you about some of the things that we did. Uh, when we were there, we had full tours of elementary schools, a very, very, very full introduction and look at education in Japan. We were placed in elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and universities. Uh, we interacted with students every day that we were there. Uh, there was uh, one opportunity in this particular program for me to work independently with a group of students. 
but sometimes that's not always the case. When we got to Japan, we, of course, were met, again, um, with a variety. We, we all originated in Tokyo and uh, had full course loads, so you could expect to wake up in the morning, go down, and you were going to have full instruction about history, society, uh, national uh, economic uh, concerns, and then cultural sites and visits. After that, which is really common amongst a lot of these global education programs, is that they will divide you up into smaller groups. So I believe that year they serviced about 100 teachers from across the United States, and then we were split into groups of 14 to 15 educators and sent to different parts of Japan. I was sent to Fukushima Prefecture, um, and uh, that's where I had the best experience, I thought, of the trip, which was an actual homestay with a Japanese family. And that homestay lasted for a full long weekend, uh, and the rest of the time they put you up in a local hotel, and most programs will give you your own room and your own bathroom. Uh, along with that, and again, these are fully funded tour. Uh, com how competitive is it to get into a program like that one? Um, I would say that for over the past couple of years, there seems to be a decrease in funding for a lot of global professional development programs. And as such, competition can be fierce. Uh, you know, it, it can be really, really competitive. And, I, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about some tips of how you can beat uh, the rest of the competition uh, when it comes time for applying. So I will uh, address that question in a bit. Um, my final project, by the way, uh, for the Japan uh, program was a capstone unit. And this particular program asked us to create a unit with four lessons, and my lessons centered about the history and, uh, and peace education surrounding uh, the event of Hiroshima in Japan. So this, you know, Japan was, for me, an opening. You know, it, it created a willingness to investigate further in the world. Uh, it uh, created a sense of exploration. Uh, I could bring the experience directly to my classroom because I would stay up every night and Skype directly into my classes uh, from Japan. So to be able to pick up my computer in 2008 and, you know, turn it around in a hotel in the middle of Tokyo was a really powerful thing for my students to see, uh, considering that the majority of my students are from uh, economically challenged backgrounds, and a lot of them have never even been out of the state of Maine. So um, it, it really uh, started something for me. The next program that I participated in was a couple of years later, well, a handful of years later, um, and that was the Teachers for Global Classrooms program. And I will tell you what, it was a foundational program for me, and it changed my entire professional life. Um, for those of you that have not heard about the program, it is open to U.S. elementary, middle school, and high school teachers uh, that want to become leaders in global education. Uh, it helps teachers to teach students about uh, what it means to be globally competent, and it also helps teachers to bring international perspectives directly into uh, the classroom. Uh, there are a number of different elements to this course. This was a bit more involved than uh, the first uh, teacher program that I did. Uh, this one was awesome because it provided me with a 10-week course on global education. So it gave me an introduction into what is exactly meant by the term global competency. It introduced me to this slide, what we see here, which are the four uh, global competencies as defined by Manzilla and Jackson in their uh, book, Preparing Our Youth to Engage in the World. You know, so it really helped me come up with strategies and tools uh, that allowed me to bring directly into my classroom and teach my students how to investigate the world, how to recognize perspectives that were outside of their own. Um, it enabled my students to learn how to communicate with audiences from all over the world. 
and probably the most foundational piece and, and the thing that was missing for me was, uh, was the ability to teach my students how to take those experiences and act upon them to solve uh, a problem in the world. Yeah, I see uh, somebody said intense coursework. Depending on what your job is and depending on your job load, um, it is a graduate level course. Uh, for me, I found it really, really, um, I found it really doable because a lot of what I was asked to do in the course itself um, applied directly to the classroom. You know, so I was creating uh, different lessons showing how my lessons actually reflected these global competencies. Um, I was able to evaluate my school, my community, and um, my state for how advanced they were in terms of global competency. It taught me how to use technology more effectively, you know, uh, and, and showed me innovative ways that I could use technology to teach about the world, you know. So uh, the course itself for me uh, was, was uh, doable. Um, like a lot of other programs, this program offered global symposium uh, before uh, departure and then at the end of the program. So what it allowed uh, individuals that were accepted in the program to do was to gather in Washington, D.C. and we could meet in groups before, you know, um, before we left for our international field assignment. Um, we got protocol lessons on what was acceptable, you know, where we were going and what was not. Um, ideas that we shared, and then you had the ability to talk with other teachers about different lessons that they were doing or the assignments, you know, uh, that you had completed. Uh, it was a great network of teachers, and I'll tell you what, uh, I am still friends with the individuals that I met and toured around with on this trip. A unique feature of the year, you know, of this program, the year that I did the trip, was that teachers were also allowed to bring an administrator with them. You know, so um, you could bring a principal or a vice principal or a curriculum director with you, and that really helped in opening their eyes, you know, to the ways that global education and global competency could benefit teachers of all subject matters, no matter what you taught. Um, the next feature of the Teachers for Global Classrooms program was the uh, actual international field experience. Um, and uh, there were a number of different countries that are offered in this program. When I applied, they asked me what countries I would like to go to on the list. And I believe the year that I went, uh, they were traveling to Ghana, Indonesia, Morocco, uh, the Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Brazil, and I'm sure that I have left something out. But um, essentially, I could rank what I wanted to do, but I didn't necessarily have any control over where I was going. So I was sitting in class the day that I got the email that said, congratulations, you successfully completed the course. You are going to Kazakhstan. And I was a bit taken aback, you know. Um, that was not really on my list, uh, but what I found in Kazakhstan was one of the uh, most welcoming um, cultures that I have ever been in in any place in the world. And I always gauge a place would I spend my own money to go back there, and I would spend anything to get back to Kazakhstan. Uh, it was just an amazing place. Um, as teachers, there were 14 of us, and we met in Almaty, Kazakhstan, uh, where we had, you know, the same introduction to, uh, to the country that we were going to be traveling in, you know, so it was lectures on history and culture and economy and things like that from a more national, you know, sort of perspective. Um, we were speaking with diplomats uh, as well. Uh, then they divided us, and we went in teams of two individuals, and we were spread all, all over Kazakhstan. Uh, my teammate and I uh, were put up by the Russian border in a place called Zarichny, uh, Kazakhstan, and we were assigned a hostess. And I can't begin to possibly describe how grateful I was 
uh, to have this experience with another educator from around the world who during her free time designed a program for my partner and I from dawn until dusk every single day uh, for about 10 days. And it was incredible. In the uh, picture that you see in front of you, in the top left-hand side, uh, those were the leaders of the city uh, themselves. They were handing us the seal uh, to the city of Zerichni. Uh, you see pictures of educators that put together huge presentations and welcome presentations. Uh, we listened to all kinds of musical performances uh, featuring traditional music um, that was performed by students. We had tours around the city uh, from everybody from community members to university professors uh, would take us places. And then, of course, we were put in uh, schools um, almost every single day, everything from primary school all the way up to university. What this program did for me is it helped me to develop a better understanding of recognizing perspectives. And I like to tell the story of a dinner that I went to with an elderly Kazakh woman uh, who invited us into her home. And I remember listening to her, you know, sort of uh, her, her struggles that she was having adapting to the newly independent uh, and more democratic nation of Kazakhstan. And she relayed to us how much she missed uh, the Soviets being in control in that area. And for a young woman uh, of my age, I grew up during the Cold War, and so it was interesting to sit back and listen and really gain, like, that alternate perspective. Uh, that was very, very clear to me. Um, the next thing that it did for me was that it uh, made me really, <laughs> you have to think fast on your feet. And, uh, and that is a place where I developed that skill. If you are going to participate in global professional development, you might be pulled up on stage somewhere uh, to maybe uh, evaluate an English competition. Or in this case, my hostess, uh, we came to a door at a university, and she said, behind this door are student teachers, and you will talk about methodologies in social studies education in America. You have two hours. Ready, go. And, uh, and the door swung open, and there they were, you know. Um, and so that was, that was absolutely an incredible, incredible experience. Let me get the, uh, I'm just going to get you guys the link for the, global te uh, the Teachers for Global Classrooms program. So, um, yeah, essentially it does. It makes you feel, you know, think fast on your feet. You can learn it. It goes quick. It goes, you know, and it comes to you when you're forced into that position, you know. So if you are leery of that thing, don't let it stop you. Um, I assure you, you will be able to adapt. The capstone project for this uh, program was pretty involved, uh, and what it asked me to do is upon return to create a capstone, uh, and so I created a digital education resource guide for Maine teachers. Uh, I can give you the link to that so that you can check it out. Um, and if you look at the image that I have put up there, it will show you the menu of the elements of the capstone project itself. You know, so essentially it gives you a really good window into a lot of the um, requirements for the course itself, you know. So I gave a rationale for global education, talked about what global competency was for other teachers, talked about technology in the classroom, and gave them specific strategies that they could use. Um, teaching uh, teachers how to take standards and globalize proficiency-based uh, standards. Uh, let's see giving them a list of community and state organizations that could help and assist with global education. I included galleries of other global professional development programs that I did, as well as a list for Maine teachers who were really, really interested in um, seeking out global professional development themselves, you know. So I think the main point of me showing you this is to not only give you insight into the program, but to also make this point. When you participate in global professional development. These are fully funded programs, 
governments and organizations put a tremendous amount of work into it, even private teachers do. Uh, and as such, I think that I have come upon the realization that it is my, uh, it's my duty, really, um, to share what I learned. You know, the main point is to do something with what, what you create, you know, not leaving it just in your classroom, but really pushing it out to a much larger audience. And as such, I started uh, presenting to people. You know, that's, that's not something I was really ever comfortable doing, you know. So it took a lot uh, to be able to go into, you know, uh, different schools or I found libraries that would uh, have me, you know, so that I could talk to just like community members that wanted to hear, you know, about other places in the world. Uh, and then I started seeking out state conferences to start presenting at. And then finally, uh, a couple of years ago, I presented for the first time at the National Council for Social Studies Conference uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, also got my partner that, that was with me over there in Kazakhstan uh, to also present uh, with me. So the both of us uh, did that together. Okay. How are we doing on time? Okay. Let's see. So the Fulbright Hayes Summer Seminar in China. The Fulbright Hayes Summer Seminar uh, is uh, offered yearly. Uh, locations do change. Three programs are offered. Uh, one program is for elementary and middle school teachers. The second program um, is really geared towards high school teachers. And the third program is uh, geared towards uh, college professors. And uh, this is funded by uh, the U.S. Department of Education. And what they do is they, uh, they actually will release the program site and topics, usually around right now, maybe a little bit later. Um, the competition for this program is uh, pretty, is, is pretty uh, significant. So I just want to take a moment, if you don't mind right now, and uh, just talk really briefly about uh, applying for these programs. Uh, the things that I have found, and not only have I written a lot of applications, um, but I have also uh, graded some applications because once the Teachers for Global Classrooms project was done, they asked former, you know, participants um, to read all of the new applications that were coming in. So these are some of the insights that I gained on this. Uh, number one, if you have a grant writing office, use them. Uh, if you don't, um, then find a friend, find a colleague, um, and have them uh, read your essays. Number two, you need to answer the questions on the application that are being asked. And not only do you have to answer them directly, providing specific examples of strategies that you use in the classroom or rationales for why you need to travel need to be really, really clear. And I have found that the most successful ones, uh, applications that I have done, uh, often link the one of going to these different areas with a specific problem that I have identified in my own community. You know, and when you do that, um, then it, it's going to remind readers of why it is you, you even got involved in global education to begin with, because at the end of the day, not about me, not about you, it's about our students, you know, so. Um, the only other advice that I have in regards to that is spelling and grammar issues. I can't tell you how many individuals put in applications that are not spell checked uh, or that grammatically are uh, a mess. And, you know, the way that these, these funders are spending thousands of dollars to send people all over the world, and they want people that have enough detail um, to pay attention to spelling and grammar, uh, because you are going to be asked to pay attention to a lot more in another country, you know. So um, I would I would highly suggest that you proofread, you give it to a friend, they proofread, you give it to a colleague, they proofread, you proofread it again, and then submit. And if you are turned away, reapply. You know, there's uh, a really, really popular program out there, the Grosner uh, International Teacher Program, that is given to, you know, uh, outstanding educators in the field of geography. I think that this will be my third year applying, and they keep saying no. You know, well, 
the very first program that I ever applied for, I got turned down. It was the Teacher International, or the International, Toyota International Teacher Program, and they said, no, thank you. And, uh, and so all you got, you know, it stings, but you just got to stand up and you have to reapply, you know, and, and that's the best way to do it. The other things that I would consider, some considerations uh, aside from how long you want to go, is uh, some programs ask for a small application fee. Usually that's more private organizations that do that, that fund trips. Some might make you pay a portion of the visa process. Um, passport fees are usually all, all you, you know, you, you have to pay for your own passports. Um, but most of the programs, all of the programs that I have traveled with have walked through the visa process and it really uh, helped me with that, so that was good. The other consider consideration that you want to make sure you think really long and hard about is uh, travel can be strenuous. And uh, being away from family, uh, children, there are, there are sacrifices that are involved with that, uh, so you need to weigh those uh, for you. You're also living sometimes in conditions that you are not used to, um, and so, you know, that are much different. And uh, food can also be a consideration, especially for my vegetarian friends out there, um, when you are placed in a country of meat eaters, um, you know. So uh, I would uh, seek out some advice from others that are part of this conference. Um, and, you know, and see how you can uh, manage that if you are vegetarian or vegan. Uh, also, you have to be willing to work as a team, you know, and really go with the flow. Um, and that's hard to do when you are super tired and you are missing home, you know. So um, really doing very important things like knowing when to take a break and uh, when to relax um, is really, uh, really important. Okay. So the China Fulbright Hayes Seminar Abroad Program also um, it did a number of things for me. Uh, first off, what we see on the left-hand side here is the sort of facilitator of the program itself. It's funded by the Department of Education, but the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations was the one, the agency, you know, that ran the entire program and planned it. Um, the benefits to that is that depending on the organization, uh, you can get membership for the rest of your life in this organization. And anybody that traveled with me on this program uh, certainly is a part of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations today. Um, we're invited to events all over the world. Um, we have resources at our fingertips that are available uh, to us at any point. I'm going to put their website up, um, including a variety of, um, of units and lesson plans that teachers that have traveled there uh, have uh, submitted, uh, mine included. The program um, also, I'd say the other benefit was that this was the first time that global professional development really solidly taught me how to link global um, events and global perspectives in with local. And, you know, really, really helping to use global education uh, to afford students the ability to understand more about their world and to really put forth the idea that, you know, not everything is, is so different, like, you know, that you can focus on things like similarities, um, which, you know, go a long way uh, in the classroom when they're looking and they're like, oh, they have that too? It's like, yeah, yeah, they do, you know, um, so. My, um, most recent program that I did was this past summer. I found a program uh, that, was, uh, that was sort of attached to the Fulbright Hayes program, and it's a groups project abroad curriculum program. Um, groups, group projects are offered by a number of institutions across the country, and what they are looking for are sometimes teachers, college professors, college students, mainly graduate students, who are willing to work collaboratively as a team on, you know, uh, to create a curriculum project and classroom activities and lessons that reflect what they learned in the countries abroad. Uh, this one uh, I found actually um, there's a there's a map that's put out 
it's not out yet, but it will be, and I'll give you the link to that program as well. Let's see. Um, but I found this just perusing, if you will, for another program that I wanted to do, and I came upon it uh, by accident. It was run by the University of Pittsburgh uh, African Studies Program. Uh, they had put in a request uh, to the Department of Education to fund a program on <coughs> Ethiopian indigenous wisdom and culture. And so they were looking for predominantly Pennsylvania teachers, um, but did not limit it to Pennsylvania teachers. So you might have uh, a handful of projects that are funded throughout the United States. They are mainly run by either organizations or universities themselves. Um, and, you know, it, it depends on what the university wants to do, you know. So some, some programs that I checked, uh, you know, only would accept teachers from New York, you know. Uh, I mean, you just have to look at the, the specific details with that to find a, a program that might be willing to take an application from you. Uh, these were my team members, Ethiopian and U.S. educators and graduate students. Uh, you know, it was, it was absolutely incredible. Um, again, we, you know, we visited homes. Uh, these people opened their homes to us, uh, schools, police departments. We worked with university students, and we worked every single day with uh, educators of English. Uh, languages uh, in Ethiopia. Most mornings and early afternoons were dedicated to lectures. Um, a particular feature of the Groups Abroad project is a, a language, a foreign language component uh, with that. And so we had daily lessons in Amharic while we were over there uh, that taught us the basics of not only Amharic, but also uh, traditional Walaita uh, language uh, as well. The group together uh, with Ethiopian educators uh, created a video about Ethiopia um, for elementary school students, and it introduced them to history, language, culture. Um, that was our collective uh, project, all of us. And from there, um, what we did was more independent projects, and those projects reflected a variety of different backgrounds. Uh, my friends there on the upper left uh, did traditional Ethiopian music. They were a music teacher and an ELL teacher uh, from uh, Pennsylvania. Um, I did a, a, a geography project uh, that asked students um, to use uh, Ethiopia and the study of Ethiopia while learning how to use a program called ArcGIS Online, which is a geographic information systems program. So using that um, enabled my students uh, to learn more about that area of the world. There was also a gender studies uh, unit that was developed by a young woman out of uh, Pennsylvania also to be implemented uh, school-wide in her school in inner city uh, Pittsburgh. All right, so I am going to finish up quickly here. Uh, these are a number. I'm going to put some links to all of these. These are the different projects that were actually created and used in my classroom um, with students and are asking students to do a variety of different things, everything from learning how to use technology, so my Exploring Ethiopian Folk Life Introduction to ArcGIS Online, we also had, out of um, my work in Kazakhstan, um, oh, sorry. Um, the ability to set up uh, an international blog for exchange between Kazakh students and U.S. students. Um, we post a couple of times each year, you know, work together uh, doing that. Um, my time, you know, through all of this global education, also, remember my initial problem that I wanted to, you know, address was a lack of diversity or knowledge about diversity. And so using everything that I've learned, we created an entire year-long study um, about diversity in uh, our area. 
um, and used things like it featured refugee students using slam poetry to teach others about their experiences. Um, we did a school-wide diversity study and, you know, published the results. Um, our students created translations of, like, the school map and signs and the parent handbook and uh, started hanging signs of, you know, in the languages of a lot of our refugee students to make them feel more at ease and more at home in a totally foreign environment. Um, and then they put together a, a global education night and invited people like the mayor, you know, and a variety of public officials and wider community members to really come and view uh, what they learned. It was an incredible, incredible experience. As a result of my time uh, in Ethiopia, one topic that kept coming up over and over again while we were there was the topic of race, uh, and especially given what was going on in the United States over the summer. And so a project has come of that, uh, a collaboration between me and a teacher out of Pittsburgh uh, who are put together um, a, a, an entire sort of enrichment program for schools um, and to teach how to teach about race in the classroom um, and to study uh, the history of race relations in the United States. Let's see. And then I'd say the last thing um, that all of this global professional development has really, really done for my, my classes is it's enabled us to address specific global issues. And uh, what I use are the UN uh, goals for uh, sustainable development. So mostly everything that we do in the classroom relates somehow uh, to these goals and is, you know, really using all of the things that I have learned, you know, um, and using the strategies, you know, to get students um, to, you know, be more, to take a more informed approach, um, you know, take more informed action, have, you know, the ability to have uh, informed discussions and discourse. You know, here in this slide in the top left-hand corner, those are my students who are grilling the U.S. ambassador to Somalia. Uh, well, former, uh, he just recently left his post. Uh, his name is Stephen Schwartz. On the right-hand side, we see some of my slam poets that traveled all over the country uh, performing their pieces um, and all over the state. Uh, my students participated in a foreign policy conference, you know, as part of an independent study, you know, um, here in Maine uh, about refugees and global migration. On the bottom left, these ladies met Andy Gittow, who works for uh, the United Nations High Commission on Refugees. And then off on the right-hand side, um, we have students that approached our state capital and lawmakers uh, that day and actually went in uh, to discuss some of their concerns with them. So um, professional development opportunities for teachers that do not live in the United States I think that this is one of the better resource websites. Uh, it's put out by the in International Institute on uh, Education. Let's see, where do I have it? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what this program does is it allows you to search programs, and, and not just uh, not just people outside of the United States, but educators, college professors, college students. Um, can, you can find programs uh, of all kinds uh, through this website. Um, I like the feature that they have uh, that allows you to search for program um, by area of the world that you're interested in or topic. And those topics can be mathematics, humanities, what, whatever it is that you want. Uh, there are a variety of them. I would say that the most popular, one of the most popular programs on that website is the ILEP program, which is the International Leaders in Education program, which fu uh, fully funds uh, teachers from outside of the United States to come into the United States and work with U.S. teachers. And uh, it's tremendously popular. And you would do a lot of the same things, you know, stay with a host family, uh, visit U.S. schools, talk to business leaders, uh, visit universities, you know, get strategies, um, the same types of things. Uh, right here in the United States. 
The last bit comes from the U.S. Department of State, uh, which has exchange programs also listed. And uh, the beautiful thing about that, uh, if you look right below that search bar in the blue box there, you can see, you can view results for if you're a U.S. citizen or a non-citizen. And that's where you will find uh, offerings like the Fulbright Hayes Summer Seminars and the Group's Project Abroad Program. And uh, those, if you want a, an idea of the the abstracts that have been um, submitted for proposal this year, uh, you can actually get those right at this website. Uh, I think that a number of universities, I think what I saw on the list was uh, a couple of trips to Ghana, Botswana, Tanzania, Brazil, you know, um, although those are not finalized uh, by any means, um, it, it will be interesting to see which ones uh, make the cut. So. Thank you so much for joining me today. I do have a survey, but unfortunately there's, I don't, oh, I suppose I could get the link for it. Um, and I guess I can take any questions that you have. I'm curious as to how your students have responded to your work, Erin. Do they feel more? So, yeah, Erin, I am like just wildly impressed here. Um, yeah, I'm curious, is as your as you're, you're immigrant and your non-immigrant students, how have they responded to this? Um, do you feel like it's engaged them more in the kind of content you're trying to teach and concepts you're trying to teach? And um, have you yeah. and then have you ever thought about taking kids abroad to do something? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, they're definitely more engaged. Uh, they feel more knowledgeable. Um, the the content itself is much easier to grasp because when you have an insight into how to look at other people's perspectives, I think that that's been one of the biggest gifts to them. Not only personally, you know, like in their own personal lives outside of school, you know, but also, you know, the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and viewpoint, you know, the, the fact that uh, for everything there's something good and something bad, you know, like you can't just classify um, things as, you know, one way or the other, you know, and it really, really forces them to evaluate that. My classes um, are pretty popular uh, in that way. I usually do have a lot of students um, that, that like, you know, or will sign up for it. Um, of course, they're high school students, you know, so there are some topics that interest them more than others. Uh, but I know that this work has enabled um, our administration has just been awesome about it uh, and been much more willing, you know, to meet the needs of, you know, like all of our students. Um, and as far as our ELL students go and like new students in the school that are traveling, you know, there's a smile that I see when, when they see something recognizable or when you greet them in the hallways in their own language, you know, like, it, it, it draws them in, you know, it creates interest. That's great. The, last, the next question I have, and then I'm going to let Wendy take the mic, is um, you, when I met you, you, you talked a lot about your GIR tour. Can you, can you address that a little bit more, too, because that was wildly impressive as well. Can you talk a little bit more about the technology and the work you've done in Maine in general with it? Sure. So uh, GIS, you can think of GIS systems as sort of like a map in a map, on top of a map, and they're all, they're all laid together. What GIS does is it enables students to see a tremendous amount of um, information all on one map, and it enables them to, you know, be able to visualize just by looking at it, you know, like, uh, for example, where the largest populations of refugees are coming, you know, from. And, you know, the circle that appears on the map correlates to, you know, uh, the data involved, how many, you know, uh, where are they coming from, uh, all of these things. Um, what I have found is that there's a number of different platforms that you can use. ArcGIS Online uh, is, uh, is put forth by a company uh, by the name of Esri, and they offer free uh, organizational accounts to teachers of any organizational institution around the world. Let me get you the website on that, by the way. Um, and so, you know, what I find is that it's beneficial because kids no longer are looking at maps on the wall. What it's doing is it's actually pulling them inside that map, and they become part of that. And it's a tremendously powerful thing. As far as GIS is concerned, and 
you know, the reason why I started the organization is that teachers don't know how to use it in the classroom, and I'm still very much learning how to use it in the classroom. I, I was not a geography student. Um, I didn't even know what, you know, that was, but a lot of state geographic alliances are offering, um, you know, like courses in how to use it. And usually those courses might be, you know, like maybe a week long. Sometimes it's in the summer. Uh, sometimes it's a couple of days, you know, so. That's awesome. Um, everyone, I want to make sure that you guys can go on to the next session, so I'm going to be a little abrupt here. This has been fabulous, an amazingly practical session for educators all over the world. Erin, you've done a huge service and you've paid it forward tonight. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I really want to get you to come down to Boston for the ASCD conference. We're doing a Global Leadership Summit there with them in March. So um, I, I will be in touch to, to, to see if we can work something out, because I think it would be a great addition to the roundtable discussions that we're planning. Um, everyone, thank you so much. Give Erin um, a huge a hand that you can you can use little icons above your name to give her some applause. And Erin, do you want to put your email in there in case anybody wants to sure. um, stay in touch with you? Sure. And that's sure. that would be great. Yay. I am so excited. This has been phenomenal. Uh, everyone, there's another set of three or four presentations coming up for the next two hours. And then um, and then there will be a uh, uh, another, we have one more keynote tonight, and I think it's Spanish and English from an author in Mexico City who's pretty amazing and interesting. So stick around. There's lots more to come, and um, have a good night, everyone, or even or day, wherever you are. Thanks, Erin.